Well, I promise uh, <clears throat> to talk really fast. No, seriously. Um, the bedside. And um, do we have a pointer here? Yeah. Is this a pointer? Okay. Uh, so in the upper left here, um, uh, I'll be talking about work done uh, in our group at the University of Oregon. And the rest of the people listed on here are uh, clinical groups that we have collaborated with. Um, and and uh, funding is listed as well. Um, and you'll note that the, the, uh, essentially all these clinical groups are from Europe, one group from, um, from Canada. Uh, so we're um, looking forward to U.S. collaborations. And that's part of the issue that I want to bring up. Uh, so as I understand it, my task here today is to uh, provide a perspective uh, from the bench. I'd like to do that by describing two uh, case studies that we have. Oh, thanks very much, Carol. Uh, two case studies um, of successful examples uh, of collaborations with clinical groups. And then uh, I'd like to discuss some of these gaps that uh, Carol alluded to. Uh, at, uh, based on our experience uh, working with clinicians. And then uh, at the end, I'd like to touch on the undiagnosed disease network as an example of uh, a way that I think we can have very successful collaborations between clinicians and basic researchers. Uh, so the first case study is uh, regarding Usher syndrome and gene discovery. So Usher syndrome uh, is the leading cause uh, of uh, genetically based combined um, deafness and blindness. Um, the uh, deafness is congenital, so present at birth. It's um, due to sensory neural hearing loss. And uh, the vision loss is due to uh, retinitis pigmentosa. So it's a relatively late onset progressive degeneration of the retina. Uh, this is a, a multifactorial uh, uh, disease. Uh, we know of 11 different genes uh, in which if there is a mutation, this causes Usher syndrome. It's a classic Mendelian uh, recessive uh, disease. Importantly, however, uh, there are still uh, many families that are unlinked uh, to any known locus. And gene discovery is extremely important for uh, genetic counseling in Usher syndrome. Uh, if you have a child who fails a hearing test at birth, uh, you'll get some counseling. You could uh, raise that child in the deaf community, which is a, is a reasonable choice. Uh, but you may also want to consider cochlear implants. And obviously, um, if this child is later going to be blind, sign language will be insufficient form of communication. And so having this knowledge up front can really help inform the decision by the uh, family about whether to move forward with the cochlear implant and obviously would um, elevate the child on the priority list for receiving a cochlear implant. However, uh, because the vision loss is very uh, progressive, uh, late and progressive, we don't have good means of testing vision in newborns. And so really, the only way to know that this uh, child uh, is later going to have Usher syndrome is through genetic testing. And if you don't know what the genes are, it's pretty hard to test for them. So uh, uh, gene discovery is still extremely important. So we have uh, developed zebrafish models of all the known um, Usher genes and are studying um, their functions. And um, I had a postdoc who was presenting a poster at an international conference. And a uh, clinician, Hanno Boltz, came up to our poster, uh, poster and said, I've got a bucket full of uh, patients and families um, and, um, and we're trying to discover what the, what the genes are, uh, do you want to collaborate? So this is really sort of a one-off happenstance uh, interaction that we had, and uh, this led to gene discovery. Um, so they, uh, th that group had done uh, whole exome sequencing of these families and came up with a candidate, uh, the PDZD7 gene, which was of completely unknown function at the time. And they had picked up uh, variants of unknown pathogenicity uh, in several different families. So how do you move forward from this? How do you uh, uh, try to show causality that mutations in this gene can cause the disease? <clears throat> so we cloned the uh, ortholog in zebrafish. 
we showed that the protein uh, co-localizes in the retina and in the inner ear with other known Usher syndrome proteins. Uh, we showed that uh, in, the, in the mutant, uh, loss of function of the, uh, or in this case of morpholino, loss of function of this protein results in uh, defective stereocilia and deafness in the uh, zebrafish. And we also showed that uh, it can lead to retinal degeneration. <clears throat> so interestingly, of the families that uh, we've identified, in every case, the PDZD7 mutation um, appears in a heterozygous form with other known Usher gene mutations, either in heterozygous or homozygous form. So here we see a family in which uh, the son is heterozygous for a known Usher gene, GPR98, um, which normally would have no symptoms at all because this is a recessive Mendelian disease. Uh, but this patient presents with Usher syndrome. This family is even more interesting. They have two daughters, each of which is homozygous for a known um, Usher 2 mutation. Um, one of the daughters carries an additional uh, variant allele of PDZD7, and she presents with much more severe symptoms than her sibling. So these types of data suggested to us that PDZD7 may actually be acting as a genetic modifier. So to analyze that, um, we could use the zebrafish to, um, uh, to model these genotypes using morpholinos. So in this experiment here, we use a half dose, in other words, knock down about 50% of the protein activity of the GPR protein and the uh, PDZD7 protein. And of course, there's no phenotype, it's heterozygous. But when we combine these two half doses, we see retinal degeneration, as in the patient. And this would be the genotype of the other family, where we have a, uh, a homozygous, a full knockdown of uh, Usher, Usher 2A, a half dose of the um, PDZD7, and this uh, exacerbates the phenotype, as we saw in the patient family. So um, uh, this suggests, again, a genetic interaction. So we were able to show with pull-down assays that these two Usher, well-known Usher proteins bind to uh, the PDZ domains of PDZD7. And uh, currently the model is that uh, these proteins actually form um, a quaternary complex. And this elevates PDZD7 uh, essentially to the, to the status of being um, a disease-causing gene. And uh, unlike um, Howard's example, uh, shortly after this work was published, PDZD7 was added to the panel of genes that are tested uh, in children who are uh, potentially, who have Usher syndrome, uh, of, of, uh, in, in which uh, gene uh, they're trying to identify um, what the actual variants are. So this is a really successful example, I think, of how you can go from the bench, from the bedside to the bench uh, and back again. But um, there are still some gaps, I think, that this successful example illustrates. Uh, first of all, um, where are the missing homozygous and compound heterozygous patients? Um, is this simply uh, the fact that it's uh, embryonic lethal? Uh, the model organism data would suggest not. We've uh, subsequently made mouse mutants. They also are perfectly healthy, half happy animals. So it seems to us more likely that there are probably uh, that the patient pool is just too small. So there are patients out there that we haven't found yet that are homozygous or um, compound heterozygous for mutations of PDZD7. So why haven't we found them? Well, um, is it because there's limited access to patient data? Um, is it uh, perhaps that the clinicians are not, not uh, telling us about the patients that they have, they're not testing them? Or worse yet, are they uh, actually acting as silos and hanging on to their patients um, and not sharing? So let's move to the second case. This is a, the opposite type of experiment in which uh, negative results can actually reveal uh, incorrect diagnoses. And this example is uh, Joubert syndrome. <clears throat> so here we had a family, a consanguous uh, family, that have uh, three children uh, with deafness. Due to the consanguinity, <clears throat> we thought we could do um, mapping for homozygosity by descent. However, this uh, was uninformative. We, we came up with no good candidates. 
Um, so again, we uh, relied on whole exome sequencing, uh, again, looking for homozygous SNPs because of the, um, uh, uh, the structure of this family. And we found uh, homozygous mutations in uh, AHI1 gene, um, which is a very well-known gene that's responsible for Joubert syndrome. Joubert syndrome, as you, as you may know, is due to uh, underdevelopment of the cerebellum and brainstem. Um, it involves uh, 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 patients present with seizures, retinitis pigmentosa, developmental abnormalities, kidney and liver abnormalities. And these patients were deaf, but had none of these other signs. And most importantly, uh, the MRI was normal, and this is the key diagnostic for Joubert syndrome, the uh, abnormality of the midbrain in which it appears sort of like a, a molar tooth. <clears throat> so uh, what's going on here? So we look at the, at the mutation, the specific allele is a truncation of the protein right at the beginning of the very important protein-protein interaction domain. So most of us, based on our biochemical training, would argue that this is going to be a loss of function because this protein cannot bind to its, its binding partners. Um, the mutations in the, data, in the various databases that are known to be disease-causing cluster uh, in more uh, N-terminal region of the protein. So again, we, we made models of this, um, uh, truncating the protein, introducing mutations in this region that's known to cause uh, disease. And this produced a very strong Joubert-like syndrome in the zebrafish, uh, which is a, a extreme uh, ciliopathy, very consistent with other uh, Joubert, known Joubert um, uh, gene mutations. However, when we uh, uh, modeled the patient, by truncating the protein, eliminating this protein-protein interaction domain, the animals uh, developed relatively normally and did not show any of the traditional Joubert syndrome uh, phenotype. So this is really um, kind of a scary result in a way because uh, patients that have this mutation would be predict predicted to uh, get the disease when in fact they do not. So I, I think this has pretty important implications for the interpretation of exome data, uh, uh, particularly um, in terms of uh, diagnoses, um, uh, 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 making uh, decisions about treatments, and uh, I think especially for the interpretation of uh, variants of unknown um, uh, pathogenicity. So we went back to the family on the basis of this and were able to obtain uh, DNA samples from other uh, SIBs and found that, in fact, one of the other SIBs uh, was homozygous for the same alleles and yet did not have the deafness. So I, I think together um, this really points out some of the, um, the, the strengths of even getting uh, negative results. So together, uh, these two studies, I think, illustrate several uh, points, several gaps between the exchange of information, the exchange of information between uh, clinical and basic researcher groups. Most importantly, uh, I think there are very significant barriers for basic researchers to access patient data. So some of these barriers might be sociological. I think Howard sort of alluded to this. It's the, uh, the different attitudes that clinicians and basic researchers have. Um, also, there, there can be certainly limited access, um, uh, and this has been our experience, to uh, clinical records. We have found that it's extremely important to get as much information as possible about the patient uh, phenotypes. And in, and in these uh, examples that I talked about there, uh, it's been sort of uh, haphazard interactions that we've had, so we've typically gotten sort of de-identified uh, clinical records. But really, if we could obtain um, IRB-approved access to the full clinical records, we could look at the full suite of, of symptoms that the patients have and thus produce, I think, much better models. And I've touched on the, on the idea, uh, too, that, um, uh, that, that there may just be uh, very limited access to patient data, and I think that's a, a problem that's a difficult one, but one that we should face and uh, perhaps uh, come up with some solutions. So in contrast, in the last couple of minutes, I'd like to just discuss our uh, interactions with the Undiagnosed Disease Network. Uh, 
as uh, an example of a very successful way to move forward. So I think as most of you probably know, the uh, UDN is composed of uh, seven uh, clinical groups distributed across the U.S. There are two uh, sequencing center, um, Hudson Alpha is here at this meeting. Uh, there's a metabolomics core, and uh, of course, most importantly, there's a model organism screening center, uh, which is uh, flies in uh, Baylor and uh, zebrafish uh, at the University of Oregon. And this group, because it is a network and a collaboration, uh, means that, that we as the basic researchers have full IRB approved access to all the clinical records. This network is uh, identifying thousands of patients with undiagnosed diseases. The sequencing centers identify the variants of unknown pathogenicity, and then we generate models uh, of those exact variants using then the wild type human cDNAs to rescue the mutant phenotypes as a proof of principle for validating these uh, variants of unknown pathogenicity as disease causing. And this is really, I think, a, 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 an excellent example um, of, of how one can have a free and open exchange of information between uh, clinical groups and basic researchers. But obviously, it's limited just to two basic research labs. Uh, so I, I would say this type of model should really be dramatically expanded um, and uh, make it available to basic researchers um, throughout the country. Um, before these inter before uh, the network came along, as I said, our interactions were really extremely um, haphazard and sort of one-off. And this is really pretty frustrating when one has uh, the best model out there, obviously, and, and wants to be able to uh, have clinical uh, collaborators um, to uh, help uh, identify the genetic basis of, uh, of undiagnosed diseases. So in summary, I've given a couple of case studies here uh, uh, where positive results can help validate uh, genes, where negative results can uh, reveal potentially um, incorrect diagnoses. Um, and I've brought up some of the issues about um, gaps, at least from the perspective of the basic researcher. Um, and uh, uh, discussed uh, briefly the undiagnosed disease network. So I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Questions? Uh, uh, thanks for that uh, great presentation. I wanted to just ask the question in the context of the negative results. Given the concept of incomplete penetrance, how do you um, weigh your negative results in the context of, of what you see within a pedigree, between pedigree and this concept that some, you know, some variants may have incomplete penetrance depending on the genomic context. How do you, how do you deal with that issue? Right. Yeah. So that's a really good, good question. And um, uh, I think in terms of the animal models, it's, it's difficult. Uh, so the examples that I talked about, we're looking at very strong loss of function uh, mutations and, and, and the, um, and essentially Mendelian inheritance. And obviously, a lot of the variants that are coming, particularly the ones through the undiagnosed disease network, um, have other modes of inheritance. So I think you have to really deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis and have as much information about the human genetics as, as possible and then try to de develop a model that will be appropriate. But there are obviously going to be limitations inherent in any model system. My question is uh, related to, to the same topic, and is uh, for me, I mean, I believe in, in the case of the Jobert syndrome, I probably I believe what you presented, and that case in which, it, the, despite being homozygous, didn't express it, is a great opportunity from my perspective to look what environmental factors, for example, dietary fat, mm -hmm. uh, from my perspective, could be influencing the expression of that, uh, of that phenotype. I, I remember for something related, like retinitis pigmentosa, mm -hmm. in which APOE and omega-3 could be right. playing a complex role there in the expression. So that's a great opportunity to uh, learn more rather than that, to dismiss that as being a, a, a real uh, finding. Right, right, very good point. Um, and I think that's the strength and probably the insight of the Undiagnosed Disease Network to include a metabolomics core. So it really makes sense to run not only the, the human tissues, 
through the metabolomics core, but also to use the metabolomic cores to analyze the, the model organisms. So yes, uh, as holistic approach as possible is extremely important, particularly in the case of these negative results. Uh, I think it's important to um, consider or think about um, the question of causality and penetrance as independent, um, although it, when you, when you um, get decreased penetrance, it makes the study of the causality more difficult, mm -hmm. obviously. But in the clinic, one could say, we know that this causes this disorder. We don't know how often it's pen penetrant. Um, so the information may still be useful to the patient, even though we don't know the complete story on the penetrance. Good, good point. Thank you. Just a quick comment that I think we can't expect that the medical record holds all the phenotype information, and I think we have to remember there's a patient in the bed or a person in the chair, and very often the information we need to correlate with the symptoms that the patient is having, only the patient knows. And so I don't know how we capture that data, but I think it's a very important issue as we go from bench to bedside and back. Yes, that is a good point. Um, I think the point I was making is that whatever patient information is available, that should be made available to the basic researchers too, because it's extremely frustrating to follow a path uh, when you have only half the information. Dan? I, I, I can't see or, I hear a voice. Rick, the one you Rex, yes, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, so this last discussion sort of moves us a little bit from, uh, you know, sort of a straight Mendelian disease. Uh, when you start thinking about modifiers, uh, that sort of moves us along closer and closer to more common diseases. I think you've already made a compelling case uh, the UDN might be a great model for how do we think about, you know, expanding the basic science clinical interactions for uh, Mendelian disease, but how far down the line do you think we can go with this in terms of complex disease? Um, right. So um, it probably uh, depends a lot upon the model. Um, so you can imagine making uh, double and triple mutants in mice, uh, but it gets painfully expensive <laughs> and difficult as you move along. Um, and so perhaps other models, zebrafish and maybe other yet other models uh, would have some benefits there when we get to multifactorial diseases. Mark, a yeah. quick comment and then a quick answer and then yeah. we'll move on. And uh, this is just in response to Deborah's um, uh, comment about the patient. I think we do have models that are emerging through uh, Genome Connect and others that are looking at innovative ways to engage patients and families in this type of, uh, in this type of work. And I think that that's something that also needs to be considered in the context of this discussion. I think we'll, we'll, we'll stop there. Uh, thank you. And move on to the clinical perspective on need for integration. Gail Herman.